Okay, hello, hello everyone and welcome to the Non-Fungible Rebels. It's me, Annie Alexander, and today I have a special guest, Omri Buton. Uh, we're going to talk about something that I haven't covered before in the podcast, uh, and I think it's it's super, super important. So we're, we're going to talk about uh, relatively serious stuff, um, but with uh, a less serious flavor, I guess. Well, it's going to be like a more casual conversation and it's going to flow more naturally, I guess. So, um, Omri, welcome to the studio. Uh, we met at um, the Def Zebu Live um, when we were on the same panel. We spoke about communities, which was very surprising to me because Omri Vuitton is basically uh, advising on legal issues um, related to Web3. He's advising Web3 projects on, on everything legal. And to hear how he he passionately advocated the importance of the communities for those projects was very refreshing and i really loved that fact so welcome amri how are you doing thank you thank you very much Andy. Thank hi everyone thank you for having me Annie. i appreciate that and uh, yeah look forward to our chat yeah um so um so yeah let's let's just start from the very beginning that's kind of you know where we always start uh we all have different different avenues um of how we ended up in this space uh how we discovered it what was our story in terms of how we ended up here and um and what we're doing so maybe we can start with that intro and and then dive into the conversation sure so um as, uh, as Annie mentioned, I'm a, I'm a lawyer. I work in London at a firm called Sheridan's that specializes in creative industries and emerging technologies. Uh, I particularly specialize in Web3. And what that means effectively is, you know, commercial and IP law, uh, meaning contractual matters and, you know, strategies and infrastructure around the intellectual property side that a project might present, as well as financial services regulation, uh, which we'll probably dig a bit deeper into in a bit. Uh, and gambling regulation, which is also very relevant when you incorporate crypto assets within, you know, different type of experiences, including video games. In terms of how I got to the space, I did not get into the space uh, because of cryptocurrencies. So Bitcoin and Ethereum, I was aware of them. And uh, but what really drove me, I, so I started my career, if you want, within the creative industries. I was a sound engineer, an audio engineer. So I had a small studio with a couple of friends with we recording artists and producing music, doing some sound design as well. Uh, so my first degree was in music production. And around the time I decided that uh, whilst I love the music industry, I wanted to do something else and maybe focus a bit more on the intellectual property side uh, of the of you know the, the studio. So I decided to study law and, and become a lawyer. And as I was studying law, I came across augmented reality. Now, uh, most people refer to it as spatial computing. And uh, I was still in my studies, but I couldn't, you know, from coming across it, I couldn't see the word any different. And I always thought, um, especially at the time, I focused all of my studies around it since finding out about it, about this technology. I, I, I always thought that regardless of how convincing a, a particular immersive experience uh, might have been, you know, in terms of like simulation or you see, you know, holograms, if you're talking about uh, a, a, mm -hmm. AR from a visual perspective, I always thought that as human beings, we would have never really felt immersed into uh, something that was real, if, you know, or, or we would have never appreciated digital assets as assets for mm -hmm. as long as we, you know, for as long as we're able to copy and paste them. So I thought, if you want to a, a convincing merging of the physical world with the digital world, we need to be able to have digital assets. And right now, we don't really have digital assets. And I think majority of people, especially outside of Web3, do not really recognize that. They might use the term, but if we look at the industry, most things come as a service because of this ability to copy and paste, which was addressed in a way through subscriptions, you know, and then the provision mm. of value, of digital value as a service. Think about music, for example, if you we went from selling copies of, you know, CDs and cassettes and so on and so forth to then suddenly being able to download them and share them um, seamlessly uh, through digital means. And yeah. that really undermined the value of, uh, um, first of all, the value of the music industry, but second, because of illegal download, but secondly, also of the value that we attribute to music because everyone loves music but we all love it whilst it costs you know 10 pounds per month max uh, on spotify and you mm -hmm. know we expect like this huge catalog of services 
And I think very few people really appreciate the the value of music as an asset. You know, the, most most mm -hmm. consumer uh, that appreciate the side are more into maybe collecting, say, vinyls or like or copies of you know CDs yeah. and cassettes. But when it comes to the digital, we really don't appreciate it. And you can buy copies, I think, still on iTunes. You know, like digital copy of a song. But the problem is that it's very ephemeral, like, you know, the access to it can be um, removed at any point. Uh, the content itself can change at any point, sometimes in good, because, you know, content can get updated and you can get better versions or additional version. But, you know, you don't have control of that particular asset uh, in a similar way that you might have over a vinyl. So I thought, like, how can that be addressed at the time? And I've started to research different type of databases, you know, for one mm -hmm. of the key terms was unique digital information, database with unique digital information. And I kept searching, I came across, you know, peer-to-peer, -peer, cloud technology and all of that, which wasn't really suitable. And then I came across a, a distributed ledger technology, blockchain. And it sounded very promising, not to store the actual content, but to store some form of proof, right? Mm -hmm. And um, it was very early days, so I did not have the understanding that I have now, you know, having worked in the industry for more than five years. But I really started to dig down this particular rabbit hole. And toward the end of my studies, I, I discovered that in Gibraltar, uh, which is a Commonwealth territory at the south of Spain, uh, Gibraltar was starting to implement a full-blown financial services framework for blockchain technology. So mm -hmm. I wanted to, you know, see if I could work there to learn more about it and see how that would apply to digital assets. And uh, I ended up moving there, working there for about two and a half years, and then I relocated to London. So during that time, that was really my boot camp, in, you know, learning about the technology. And at the time when I was working in Gibraltar, I didn't deal with any Web3. It was purely fintech. I mean, it depends what your definition yeah. of Web3, but it was pure financial technology. So it was working for exchanges, helping them, you know, get as part of a yeah. team, naturally not myself alone, uh, getting, you know, the authorization from the uh, financial services regulator in Gibraltar. So I really got a good understanding of how the technology works, the different type of structure, the different, uh, you know, at an infrastructure level. Mm -hmm. And even though I moved in the space because of digital assets, I completely failed to realize at the time because I was so focused on fintech that NFTs were starting already to, you know, exist in parallel to fintech. And I think many people that were in crypto, and by crypto, yeah. I mean, you know, ICOs, like you, you mentioned it as DeFi, but- like The altcoins, yeah. Right? It wasn't as easy to just fall within, and I wasn't on Twitter. That was a big, fa big failure on my part. I wasn't on Twitter at the time. All of this to say, I could have bought punks. I remember like so early on, like I remember telling the partner I was working for at the law firm in, uh, in Gibraltar, you know, man, I, I cannot wait for this technology to be applied to video games because always been mm -hmm. like a big uh, gamer, you know, played World of Warcraft for like 10 years plus. And I remember being, I cannot wait for this to be applied. And in the meantime, little did I know that, you know, this subcategory, sub community within, within the space was developing, you know, with NFTs, with crypto kitties, crypto punks, and and so on and so forth, and yeah, I wish I, I learned about it sooner. But <laughs> I really joined Web three, I would say, in twenty twenty end of yeah twenty twenty one, I would say, end of twenty twenty. <laughs> okay, got it. Well, I, I I still remember the time. So basically, crypto kitties were in in two thousand seventeen, I believe. So at the time when the ICOs were booming, and and what happened was, I remember like you know I, I was part of an ICO team, and and like you know I, um, all the dungeons were basically, um, yeah, participating in in ICOs and getting different altcoins and and wishing for the Lambo and waiting for the moon and all that <laughs> yeah. stuff. Um, but and and that was the time when crypto kitties came to the market and and everyone like you know started um buying and breeding those kitties and they they literally broke ethereum and you know the the all the transactions were stuck uh so these altcoin dungeons were were super frustrated like what's going on like what what, we, what are these stupid kitties what's happening like you know we can't really do our ico stuff it's it's really getting on the way um and actually i did interview 
uh, the the creator of Crypto Kitties um, and you know, the the previous um, co-founder of uh, Dapper Labs. Dapper Labs. Yeah. And 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 basically the whole mission, that the task and the mission that he got um, when he ended up with as a solution being Crypto Kitties uh, was to make blockchain fun. And I think that mission was accomplished definitely because I knew people for whom their entry points to the blockchain, to actually opening wallets. And I don't even think MetaMask Axie. was around. I think it was uh, uh, my- Kitty. They were they were a uh, Kitty player, like to your point, you know, like oh, they yeah, definitely achieved yeah. the mission. Like that's where so, the inspiration so came from for Axie Infinity, yeah. Yeah, so I, I think it's, um, I, I, you know, to that point, I think we are missing fun stuff at the moment um, because maybe we had some attempts in the beginning during the NFT um, hype cycle, but, but now I kind of, yeah, I'm not seeing much fun stuff happening from the NFT space uh, in terms of, you know, projects or, or games or services, everything for now, and unless it's being developed kind of, you know, in stealth mode and we don't see it yet. Yeah. I don't think there is so much excitement around anything at the moment. Um, and while we touched the NFT space, probably we can start from there and then move to move to the fintech you know fintech and crypto part uh for nfts i think from the regulatory perspective um there are, there are loads of there is a lot of confusion among the artists and and other and projects about the ip rights and the copyright and and how you can actually use someone else's art in which capacity like you know can can you use it as part of your stuff how much it needs to be changed in order not to violate the law um you're minting the nft so basically it's a token it's not really the image how much of that kind of you know has to do with the basically uh, violating the copyright of the artist who made the image and all that stuff. So can we unpack that part a little bit? Because, yeah. you know, we also had the uh, Rider Rips Board Ape Yacht Club collection sort of, you know, example uh, as an example to sort of look into it. So, so yeah, I guess um, the conceptual art, the copyright, using other artists' work, existing yeah. images and all that stuff. Um, if we could dive into that, I think it will be very useful for artists who are actually have different ideas and would like to, to mint some collections maybe. Yeah. So let's start. so one thing that I just wanted to note before we jump into the AP is that you mentioned that you know there aren't uh, as many fun use cases at the moment. Yeah. I think part of it is because of course everyone wanted to just implement the blueprint that demonstrated uh, success and so it was all just a copy of another project. And 10k another... 0.08 exactly yeah, right? yeah, yeah exactly yeah. yeah utility roadmap uh, you know like none of that but yeah. but i think also what well, in small part at least I, i've dealt with clients that had very 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 interesting uh, plans and and project and and you know product that were they were developing and that's where regulation sometimes can come in the way you know of developing it mm. because mm especially if part of the fund revolves around, you know, trading assets, being able to earn them and then sell them, but we'll get to it later. In terms of uh, NFTs and sort of the um, IP issues that tend to, you know, uh, embrace the space, I would say, so NFTs, first of all, uh, like, like you mentioned, are uh, crypto assets, you know, similarly to how Bitcoin and Ethereum are, they work on different standards sometimes, sometimes they have like hybrid standard, but without focusing too much on the technicalities, you can think about NFTs, generally speaking, as sort of a convergence product. So it's one product that has multiple products within it. So think about mm -hmm. it, you know, just a, a profile picture NFT, right? So you have the actual token, which is the cryptographic asset, which is registered against, you know, on the blockchain against, you know, a particular wallet that signifies yep. ownership of the token itself. Mm -hmm. Although open as, open bracket, closed bracket, you know, we always hear, oh, you own the NFT, always the content, it depends. There are questions around whether you always own the NFT, because if I remember correctly, uh, there is a famous artist called Pac within the yeah. space. And if I'm not mistaken, one time he has experimented with a smart contract where he was able to recall an asset from uh, someone else's wallet. So I think that the smart contract ultimately rules who actually owns mm. the, the crypto assets in question. 
Yeah, theoretically, you could have a smart contract that burns the asset in your wallet, right? You could also have a smart contract that burns. Well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But, but in terms of, um, you know, t talking about like, you have at least two elements when it comes to, to an NFT. You have the cryptographic asset, and then you have the content. Now, the cryptographic asset is normally stored on the blockchain, which is what ma makes it, you know, a, a token. Yeah. And then you have the content, which is normally stored out like in a, in a different type of database than the blockchain because of data limitation. Some that doesn't always apply. Some NFTs are recorded on the blockchain as well. Yeah. But like generally speaking, monkeys on chain and some other collections. I think there, right? I think yeah. there are a few. Yeah. But um, but generally speaking, the the content is on a separate database. Uh, normally, it's uh, the interplanetary file uh, file system or IPFS. Yep. You have Earwave as well. You have a few options, but that are peer-to-peer -peer databases. So again, it's not a centralized database like an AWS, you know, Amazon service, where if you stop paying for the, uh, let's say, storage facility, then the content becomes unavailable. And the way it works yeah. when you go on OpenSea or an aggregator like OpenSea, you, you can see, you can view the token and the content associated with it. So normally the cryptographic, like the token itself would have, you know, Think about it like a hyperlink that points toward the, the content location on a yeah. separate database. Yeah. And that's what allows you to visualize it like on the open on OpenSea and other uh, aggregators. Yeah. So when we talk about do you own the IP when you own the token, by default you don't. Because remember, you own the token, generally speaking, but the content is separate. It's almost like you're looking at window and that you know, across the window, there is the content. Yeah. What governs the terms of the content are the terms and condition. So normally when you buy an NFT, there are terms and conditions that the, the project releases and you have different different type of licenses. So the, the kind of document or provision within term and condition that tells you what you can do with that piece of IP that is associated with, with, the, with the token itself, it's called a license. So a license effectively sets out the terms pursuant to which you can use that IP. So if we go back to traditional art, normally the only right that you get when you buy an artwork, like think about the painting, is the right to display it and mm -hmm. to access it, first of all, and to display it for non-commercial purposes. Because, yeah. for example, if I buy a painting at a gallery and then I decide to open an exhibition with the painting, I might not have the right to do that, right? And I definitely yeah. normally don't have the right to start selling prints of that painting. So I'm just buying the ability to, to display it, you know, for own commercial yeah. purposes. Similarly, in NFTs, that tends to be the case when it comes to more traditional art or artists that come from traditional art. So if you think about Artifact and the collection that they've done, you know, the Clone X collection, mm -hmm. they have separate terms and condition from between, you know, clones that incorporate Murakami's art and clones that are free from Murakami art or the Murakami drip, how they call it. So mm -hmm. the Murakami drip, like clones that are incorporate Murakami's art are effectively treated as traditional art. You can only access it and display it for no commercial purposes. You can use it, but not commercially because you have a 3D asset, you know, that you can download by, by owning the clone X. Whereas the other clones are subject, at least some time ago, I don't know if they change it again, but some time ago, you, you had like a commercial use up to a certain value. So you could use them up until a certain point. But I, but I believe like they've changed the IP terms. So the first one, as we said, like the Murakami one tends to be the more sort of traditional way of licensing art, which is you have no commercial use. Yeah. What's interesting about NFTs is that they've introduced this, what I'm calling, you know, community building uh, IP, like, uh, you know, community building sort of leverage uh, um, build of, building of the IP, which means that you buy the artwork or like in this case, you buy the NFT and the IP stays with me as the project owner, but I'm giving you a commercial license, meaning that you can use that particular asset commercially. Now, the terms of the commercial license can vary. Some are uncapped. For example, uh, Bored Ape, like uh, if you look at Yuga, there is an uncapped use. You can make as much money as you want using that particular piece of IP. Uh, other tend to have a cap. And for example, that was the case for, 
but the original CryptoPunk license, or at least the alleged, you know, the, there was a license that mm. was available only for like a day, I think, or a few hours, and that was taken down. But you have uh, Doodles, I think, has a capped value. So what that means is that you can use it commercially up to a certain point. So for example, up to $100,000 in revenue, mm. after which oh, yeah. you need to contact the project to secure a better license that allows you to further commercially leverage that. And why do some projects do that? Is because if I'm starting to use a piece of IP, say, and it becomes very successful, well, me and, as the project owner want to partake in that success. So I would probably ask that you give me part of your revenue. And then the last yeah. one, which you, tr you traditionally encounter, is what is called CC0 or CCO, that is normally confused with a commercial license. So if you spend time you know, on crypto, like on Twitter spaces, you would have people saying, oh, yeah, yeah you guys CC0. No, you guys not CC0. You guys, they grant you commercial right, but only the holder of an NFT can commercially leverage the ape that is associated with it. So the difference mm. is that CC0 is, almost, is effectively a waiver over over the IP. To an extent, there are so there are different there are different forms. So you can use the... even without being a holder, you can use Correct. any of that. Yes of Correct, any yeah. item from the whole collection um exactly. a question in that case so basically the way i imagine it like you know when you were talking in my head like i had like two two dimensions basically like you know the token side and the nft token tech side was basically governed by web3 ethos and then on on top of it you had terms and condition which was kind <clears> of you know web2 legal stuff so yeah. um so Knowing the people who who were and still are involved in in the NFT um, speculative field, so I'm talking more about the PFPs. Uh, I highly doubt they open and read those terms and conditions, obviously. Uh, which which I presume you'd be surprised. they do. They spread them apart most of the time. The first, and that's something that you know, as a lawyer, wow. you almost never get to experience a community that is so uh, ready to just go through the terms and condition, check the IP clause as a first thing. Oh, that's and... that's really interesting. I didn't expect yeah. that at all. Uh, but, you know, are there any cases, like, obviously, you, you, you have those on your website um, when you release the collection. Mm -hmm. Can you change your mind and kind of, you know, change those afterwards and while i purchased it i read the first version so i'm getting you know mm. i i presume i bought it because i thought i was getting that first yeah. version what happens then like is it that's a very good question and i'll preface this saying that i'm not a litigator and that is leaning more toward the litigation side of the equation but okay. you can reserve the right contractually to change the the the, the, the scope of the license so the the terms of the license you can do okay. that whether it's enforceable or not you know, you start to have some doctrines that might, that which application, you know, is quite complex. But generally speaking, you can change the terms of the license and you will see many terms and conditions that say at the beginning, you know, we retain the right to change the terms at any time. Uh, it is your obligation to, you know, check uh, from time to time the terms and make sure that they're reflective. But to be honest, like from a legal side, it's very important, of course, but from a practical side, if a project was to do that, it would be almost a suicide. And we've seen it, I think, a couple of times with Moonbird, where at the beginning they said that effectively you yeah. own the IP, which is a terrible idea because think about it. Who, whoever owns the intellectual property makes the rules, okay? So yeah. if I am the project and I own the IP, you buy my NFT and I say, well, I'm not licensing to you the IP, I'm assigning it to you, I'm transferring it to you. Now I can no longer make the rules of the game. Now you are the owner of the IP and you get to make the rules. So potentially you could sell that NFT, but keep the intellectual property over it because you decide what to do with the IP now. The IP is yours. Mm. Do you see what I mean? Which is why it's a terrible yeah. idea to assign the IP. And it's the, the, the only way that I can see it really working commercially from a practical perspective is to have licenses that are very detailed, very technical, that try to account for every situation. And that's how you retain control. Even if your goal is that of sharing the IP with your community, it's important that you set the guidelines of that use and, and you do that through the license. But for example, in the case of Moonbird, at the beginning they said you own the IP, then they change it to a commercial license. And more recently, 
I don't remember what happened. I don't remember if it was CCO for a period and went to commercial or from commercial, they limited the use in some way. I just remember that recently I've seen something about the IP and of course the community. Went, I can, you know, I, yeah, I can imagine this happening because like, you know, fr fr from my experience, from kind of yeah. you know, working in this space, um, you talk to three lawyers, um, you have three calls with three different lawyers. After each call, you have a feeling that you have to to change something based on the advice, right? So it's, it's you know, I, I can imagine the temptation or, or you know, the, the reasoning that periodically like these projects yeah. will, will, will get confused or, you know, not really consult lawyers in the very beginning. So, so basically uh, they, they come up with these creative ideas in terms of how they can shape their token and the tokenomics, like different elements to it, right? Um, and, uh, and obviously the very first question I'm asking is like, did you speak to a lawyer to understand whether legally you're allowed to do that? Like legally it, it falls under the securities kind of, you know, category or not, because I, I feel like that kind of really changes a lot in, 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 in everything else that you're, you're envisioning and, and kind of, you know, um, planning for that token specifically starting from how you can promote it uh, finishing with kind of you know how how you position it in that sense um uh and and obviously like yeah when you don't do that later on it's it's much bigger issue um the later it gets the, the bigger the issue gets so are there any specific sort of fundamental logical you know high level things like checklists in terms of okay you know these are the, the times where it's definitely going to be a security no matter what you have no way out of it these are the things you have to pay attention to when you are coming up with your tokenomics and the way you're shaping your token yeah so first i need to say you know for uh, for legal reason this is not legal advice so please consult the lawyer and um, what i would say is that normally there are so the most effective time to engage a lawyer for a product review so i would start always with the product review so you mm -hmm. you, you basically have a business plan or a white paper submit that to to a competent lawyer and try to understand what are the regulatory implications of it uh, and the most effective stage to do that is before you start to develop the product, or at least at the same time, because the problem is, yeah. and it happened with a few clients, clients have presented themselves after developing the product, which took months, you know, huge investment in terms of time and money, only to then find out that some aspects of the, of the product that they want to, to release can create, you know, considerable issue, not only from, from a financial services perspective, for example, securities, but also from other uh, perspectives, like anti-money laundering, it's a big one. In the UK, we've had the framework now for some time that um, yeah. involves, you know, the that embraces activities from the issuance and exchange of tokens to the custody of tokens on behalf of others. So there are mul multiple activities that can result in, you know, that can, can produce some regulatory implications and require compliance uh, with them. But also from a gambling perspective, you know, surprisingly now less, I think I'd say that uh, the, the, you know, business owner and project owners are becoming increasingly aware of the different type of regulations that might be relevant to them. But two years ago, when I, you know, normally when I would mention gambling to say a Web3 game, they would look at me like, why gambling? Like, isn't this just about securities and that's about it? Mm -hmm. And the problem is that Gambling regulation becomes very relevant the moment that you incorporate cryptographic assets in a video game, because then suddenly you distribute tokens that the player can extract from the game and sell. Not only yeah. gambling regulation, again, all of the all of what we just mentioned, financial services, anti-money laundering, and as of the 8th of September, financial promotion as well of uh, qualifying crypto assets, which means generally speaking, uh, you know, fungible and transferable. Um, all of these activities must be considered before you start, um, you know, before you publish your project, before you make it available to others, because you can't go back in time. So if you start to release a product that is infringing on, on applicable regulation, you know, it, it can be a difficult territory to navigate. And you also put the lawyer in a very tight spot because it's a lot harder and it's more expensive to try yeah. and fix things later. And, you know, it's, so I would say the most effective stage at which to engage a lawyer to check 
you know, compliance is the design stage of a product because you can understand how to structure your business. You can understand what type of um, mechanics to remove from, from your product or service if you don't want to, to become regulated. If instead you want to become regulated, same at the design stage, just be mindful that it's also useful to engage a lawyer at the design stage because as you develop the product, you can also start to, uh, you know, the sort of road to registration in the UK. One day it's going to be authorization probably, but you can start yeah. to, you know, structure yourself, start the conversation with the with the financial conduct authority, which is the regulant, uh, the relevant regulator here, because that's going to take time. It's not like you wake up tomorrow. Here is my product. Okay, it falls within say. The money yeah. laundering regulation okay yeah let's register you know it's a it's a process it's not you know it's oh yeah definitely and, and i think like yeah. the more you touch the i mean from my like very sort of newbie and non-lawyer perspective i feel like you know if you are coming up with any product and service from this space that is ever at one point from the user journey gonna touch fiat then it's definitely need to be regulated yeah but I mean, even without there's fiat. absolutely no way yeah, out yeah, of yeah. it right yeah, yeah but even without fiat so like you know an exchange activity is crypto for another crypto or crypto for fiat so you don't even need fiat and for video games for example and gambling regulation some clients come in expecting that oh, okay if uh, if it's uh, not pay to enter so if there is no ticket at the beginning or there is not you know um uh, gated like against some sort of value that i'm fine which is not the case because uh, gaming as a gambling activity is the final playing playing a game of chance for a prize so as long as you have a game of chance and a prize you don't even need like pay pay to entry in order to potentially fall yeah. within the gambling regulation so it's and and the problem you know is that uh, look i'm i'm i feel for a project and and people that want to innovate in the space because Compliance is expensive and understanding your, you know, the, the regulatory implication of your product is also expensive. Unfortunately, you know, the more regulated the space, the more limiting it can be to try and access it as a, as a provider. So I feel for a project, but it's really hard for lawyers to be able on a half an hour call to give you a blueprint. And I'm not talking about this, I'm talking generally, you know, this is what you need to avoid this is what you can do go on and do it yeah. because no i get it yeah it takes so much to, even as even as a lawyer like you know and i've been working in the space since end of 2017 still you know there are in the day-to-day -day, some some circumstances cases present themselves and it takes you some time to familiarize yourself with the issue because it's just so new and it can be so complex and it can involve so many different parties and you know the, every activity you need to consider not just one piece of regulation but i just named four during this conversation there are other potentially you know consumer protection yeah. data uh, data protection you know like you have yeah. so many elements to consider and i hope that i don't sound as someone that is being um you know that is trying to sort of fad let to use a term from within no 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 it's, it's like you know i i think it's important to talk about this because like you know mm. you, you have two extremes right you have people who come to this space who who sort of you know uh, are are all about fuck the banks i don't care yeah. about authorities i i don't gonna i'm not gonna pay taxes i don't really care about low like i'm here yeah. just because of that because i hate all that and i i want to avoid all that right so so we have like that extreme and then we have the other extreme who are kind of coming from institutional side of things and who are building something yeah. and are looking at things maybe even like too extreme from that side yeah. uh, in a sense that they shouldn't really go so deep into the whole thing right and probably like you know the the more sane approach should be somewhere in between the two uh but but i have found that this space is very extreme and emotional in most cases so there isn't really sort of this medium ground uh, in uh, often it's, yeah. it's just one or the other right so you end up with with the you know when when DeFi summer came along like the you know there wasn't much uh, regulation from yeah. that perspective during the ICO times. It was the wild, wild west, and I think like 
most of the scams that that happened like no one really even thought that they were going to be punished right so it was kind of this this whole environment where there wasn't regulation in place yet no one really understood yeah. the space and people thought that yeah i mean now this is the environment where i can do pretty much everything that i want and no one is going to really come after me right now we're seeing this all this kind of you know lawsuits against the influencers against the the projects um you know from um being targeted from scc and and the exchanges and everything else right now we see some precedents in terms of okay this may be a bit serious before we didn't have that like we we didn't really like you know you could uh, a marketer like marketers in the space could pretty much like blatantly shield coins uh, and, yeah. and nothing would happen, right? Um, and talking about that specifically, so um, I know there is some kind of, you know, and, and since I mentioned that kind of, you know, we were on the same panel about communities, um, obviously communities are are the sort of, you know, the, the heart center of, of the project and they make or break projects. So yeah. the communication with those communities and, and the, in, the way we incentivize those communities is very important, right? Um, but both of these sides are also regulated and have different laws that we have to comply with right so as far as i know like it doesn't really matter whether you're making a public announcement or not or just talking to your community on discord what you say and how you say things and how you're addressing the topic of price and the token speculation and sort of you know the potential forecast and all that stuff that is something you have to be careful about right on the other hand you know we all kind of have um have this really bad habit in the space of bribing our communities, quote unquote. And and obviously, you know, through the technology, the easiest way is just airdropping stuff and then airdropping more stuff and, and then a little bit more yeah. and, and kind of, you know, and, and carrying on like, you know, let's give one token and then, okay, let's come up with another token and, and give that on top of it. Let's have additional collection of the NFT PFP thing and yeah. then, you know, whatever, whatever. So so can you sort of talk a little bit about, you know, um, yeah, our relationship with um, with the communities and, and how much of the regulation actually impacts that? Because I feel like, you know, that too, as you said, the innovation is is being yeah. hindered a little bit um these these two can be you know an issue eventually yeah for sure so when whenever it comes to crypto assets uh, now in the uk at least because again we're talking about international communities of participants right so we i can talk about the the uk and uh, but there might be other rules that apply so but when we think about the uk there are two main pieces of regulation, let's say, or like that, that apply in the, in the context of uh, marketing and promotion of cryptographic assets. One is under the uh, Advertising Standard Authority CAP code, and that has been in place for longer um, than the next one that I'm about to say. And uh, that one requires you, you know, to have appropriate disclosure, to be transparent, not to, you know, th th there are certain require cer certain requirements to the quality of the communication and the advertising standard authority has been actually quite um proactive in enforcing it now when you read mm -hmm. the type of cases that it has enforced against i think they were really good enforcement action because these were clearly you were clearly talking about you know um sort of pump and dump scheme or uh, it, you know mm -hmm. type of type of schemes and activities that generally even if you are very bullish in the in the space and the technology you probably don't want in the space so i thought that he did a really good job um and just to clarify the advertising standard authority is a separate regulatory body to the financial conduct authority which is the fca and that's the financial services regulator yeah so yeah. the second piece of regulation that is extremely important and it's causing a bit of a racket uh, right now of a havoc in in the space is uh, the new rules effectively the financial promotion regime which already applied to uh, you know, traditional specified um, specified investments and and to regulated activities. So think about securities. Think about you know, you couldn't just go and promote freely securities. There were certain conditions. There was a certain uh, yeah. uh, there were certain requirements from a compliance standpoint 
these now have been, um, the, the regime has been expanded to cover also qualifying crypto assets, which are, again, generally speaking, uh, fungible and transferable crypto assets. So if you carry out a promotion relating to certain type of activities, which are very broad. So if you, if you carry out a promotion on qualifying crypto assets, like facilities to buy and sell those, or, or you know, basically from that point onward, you, you can no longer do that in the UK unless you fall within certain categories of, you know, of, um, let's say publishers or persons. So you must be either authorized by the FCA to do that, act um, under the approval of one of these authorized firms or otherwise be registered uh, pursuant to the money laundering regulation, which is what we discussed earlier. So, so if you're um, not a Twitter, if you're just a Twitter influencer and you cannot just, financial, you know, you yeah. can't do what you have been doing all your <clears throat> life, basically. Well, it depends. Space. It depends how you promote. But yeah, not, generally speaking, influencers need to be careful. And the FCA has actually released guidance for, for influencers or influencers, I think that it called them, like influencers <laughs> within the financial yeah. technology sector. Financial. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, they definitely need to be careful. They can potentially carry out the promotion if they act under the approval of a, a firm that can approve financial promotion for qualifying crypto assets. How does that change the communities? It depends what communities we're talking about. So during the past few years, you've had this raise in, rise of uh, Telegram groups or WhatsApp chats, you know, where people like effectively alpha groups, trading, yeah. exactly, alpha groups. Mm. That, that I think is very dangerous. Uh, when you're talking about communities, maybe more Web3 centered around art and collecting non, uh, non uh, you know, NFTs, non-fungible token, probably a little bit less, but I would still be very careful, especially if any part of the project involves qualifying crypto assets. You need to be extremely careful. So if, say, you buy an NFT, but as part of the promises, you're going to receive, you know, you're going to receive qualifying crypto assets or the crypto asset, qualifying crypto assets are otherwise going to be involved, then you need to be very, very careful. And again, it really depends on how the project is structured, where it is operating from, where it is offering those assets into. So there are different yeah. elements that one has to consider. So I won't be able to give you like a definitive answer on the call on, on this podcast, but I would say be very mindful. Also because monetary and non-monetary incentives to engage in investment activities, so activities that involve qualifying crypto assets of this yeah. particular type are banned now. So you cannot, you can no longer offer these type of incentives to, to, you mean airdrops, people. for example? Airdrops, including airdrops, not only though, like okay. also non-monetary incentive, perhaps tickets to, I don't know, a particular event or entries. You need to be very, very careful because it's monetary and non-monetary incentives that are banned. Okay, got it. To try and what about people. kind of some kind of reward or loyalty? So also very you know, difficult. Oh, you also yeah. need to be careful. You need to assess it. Wow. You need to be careful. I'm not saying that every reward uh, you know, mecha mechanism is banned. Uh, but you need to be careful if that reward mechanism incites you to, you know, to engage in the investment activity, in an underlying investment activity. But like discount codes, you know, or subscribe to this exchange and get X amount of free, uh, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, Bitcoin, which was a very popular one up until yeah. now. Yeah. The referral so, systems as well, right? Yeah, yeah, you, yeah, you need yeah. to be, you need to be care mindful of that. I'm not saying that they're outright like. I'm not saying that they're all automatically legal, you know, but what I'm saying is be careful because they okay. are banned in certain instances. And so I would encourage you if you are operating one of these, um, you know, platforms or one of these, if you're offering one of these products or services, please consult with a lawyer because, you know, the FCA has also been extremely proactive in enforcing this financial promotion regime in the past days. So be mindful of that. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, I, I... Like I have mixed feelings about this because obviously, like you know, uh, as a marketing person, it's 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 gonna complicate my life a lot for sure. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, though, like you know, to me, like at the moment, until now, all we've seen in terms of creative marketing was different ways of saying you're gonna get rich. 
yeah. if you buy whatever, my NFT or my altcoin, my shitcoin, my meme coin, whatever, right? That has been basically the the main narrative and the main sort of, you know, way to attract your user base, yeah. no matter what you're doing, whether it's DeFi, NFT, PFP, whatever it is. Um, so now that you're not allowed to do that, I hope that we're going to have more creative stuff coming in and better ways to to basically do real marketing versus the whole shit show that was happening yeah. out there <laughs> but within, within so. the rules right because you need to remember like if you look at other type of you know tradition traditional sort of specified investment or like regulated product if you look at the marketing around marketing around them it's quite dry because these are regulated right it you can't is. just go yeah. around and be like hey you can buy a security and get rich tomorrow it's you know it's it's a lot more it careful. Is. So yeah. So, yeah. So I, so, think... so I think that that's that's the, the creative part, sort of you know, figuring out how to make that dry thing more exciting, but at the same time also legal. So that's that's yeah. where the uh, <laughs> the sweet and, and spot uh, needs to be somehow. Yeah. And and also who you act for, because I think that that's going to be the change, right? Is as as a marketing person, you're going to want to act for people that either are able to approve your financial promotion or work as part of someone that is authorized or that is approved or is registered you know so it's in a way that that is the goal of the regulation is to increase the quality of the of the service providers that can access the uk market look it's going to be a, as i mentioned at the beginning it's going to be a shock and now probably you understand you know, part of why it's going to be a bit of, of a shock to the system. But hopefully yeah. in the long run, you know, I, I I hope that in the long run, this is going to result, result in a net positive for the UK. Because when you're looking at regulation, you as a jurisdiction, you can decide to go about it in a limited number of ways. Either you regulate it, uh, as the UK is doing, and then you adjust regulation to meet, you know, the, the needs. And I think mm -hmm. the UK is consulting uh, quite a lot with the industry and with specialists, which is a positive. The other option that you have is to just remain silent and let activities, you know, take place um, or deregulate. And I think that can be attractive in the short period because, of course, you attract a lot of players within the market. But as more and more jurisdictions around the world start to regulate and limit your ability to access their market, yeah. unless you meet certain conditions and criteria then it starts to become limiting to players that are based there so you know i think that reg you know regulating appropriately is is key and uh, i'm not you know i'm not breaking any news but i do think the regulation is important i do think though that um especially the financial promotion regulation is going to be a bit of a and it is already to an extent a shock to the system in the, to, to UK provider. Yeah, I mean, I can imagine because like no matter what you're doing in this space, it all kind of, you know, hits finances eventually in yeah. some capacity. Uh, you know, you can't really avoid it. It's ha it, the whole space has been built around the, you know, the crypto, around the money, around basically kind of giving this possibility to people of having potential gains in the future right so um so i feel like you know there is a, as you said like even gaming or any other projects that may seem that they they are not really yeah. into the financial services you know um uh, sector specifically but they they still hit those crypto asset kind of um ticks and 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 they they too kind of fall under that whole so i feel like you know that regulation is going to cover like umbrella cover very broad. The, the whole like very, very almost broad. everything right so um which is which is kind of good because in in a way sort of you know um uh, well, good, de depending where you're at, right, in the space and, and what, what your philosophy about this is. But but I feel like probably regulation would, you know, would make people from outside and brands from outside feel more comfortable to enter the space and therefore trigger yeah. Yeah. mass adoption, uh, maybe. Um, on on the other hand, it's it's kind of I don't know. I'm I'm listening to you and I'm like, oh, does this mean that in in five years of time, this this space is going to become 
boring or you know it's 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 kind of it's gonna make or break yeah. the thing right it all depends how how the participants are gonna react to it and how they are gonna adjust to that right are they gonna be yeah. able to keep that ethos to keep that whole kind of you know fun part and and the I don't know like you know I, the, yeah the I don't that are uh, that I don't want to die you know because yeah I, I I I see where you're coming from to be to be honest with you uh, during the bull market, it was definitely an exciting time, but it was also very consuming, it, even within the NFT space, you know, in terms of like, you never really felt that you won. Like, even if you bought an asset and sold it at three times the value, if then it went to times 10, you felt that you lost. And if you uh, didn't sell at top and then sold at bottom or held, you always felt like, oh, I didn't make enough of this trade which was yeah. very consuming. And I think it took away a little bit from, um, for me at least, the reason why I, I was so excited and I still am very excited about the technology. So I think that what I don't, and to be honest with you, I'm, I, you know, I identify as being part of this community also as a fan, not just as a professional. I, you know me, I'm going to uh, event yeah. help or organize, you know, meetups and all of that. But like, I'm not, you know, I think that I'm, I'm more excited about the convergence of technology as opposed to just being ideologically a maxi of one. So, yeah, like, you know, I'm not just, oh, crypto is everything, AI, who cares about AI? You spoke about AI now. So, like, you know, you sold your soul to this new upcoming industry. And as I mentioned to you at the beginning, the reason why I'm in crypto to begin with is really augmented reality or spatial computing because I think that blockchain is going to provide the much necessary layer infrastructure layer to digital assets which we are going to experience through spatial computing. So that's what excites me the most. And I think now with the advent of AI, which to be honest with you at the time I did not expect when I was what was it, 2015, 2016, I wasn't really following it. And you know, when ChatGPT arrived, I was whoa, caught a bit like, you know, off guard. But I can definitely see that blockchain again provides a very useful uh, infrastructure for a an AI dominated world because of you know provenance of information, uh, proof of humanity when you're dealing in uh, you know interactive experiences and you don't really know if you're dealing with a human being or a bot or some form of you know AI enabled uh, entity. Mm. So I'm excited at what blockchain facilitates. I'm not as excited about blockchain itself, you know, at the time when, yeah. uh, and I mean, I don't want to sound like some, again, bear in mind, this is my job, like not only my job, this is what I decided to take a risk on and specialize in blockchain, not, not this other. And so I'm very bullish about it, but it's just, I see, um, I have a lot more interest in how blockchain can empower other sort of experiences and technologies as opposed to just looking at blockchain in a vacuum and saying, oh, this is the best. I just want the pure use of blockchain to you know, transfer a uh, sort of assets or value uh, amongst other people, peer to peer, without any intermediary, without any centralized sort of, of involvement. And I know not everyone agrees with me and I'm fine, I, I respect that. Personally, I've found that intermediaries in, the good, in a good amount like, okay, and I'm not saying going all the way to a centralized world, can be convenient. And it's good, It's very hard for me to believe in a fully decentralized, large-scale adoption of blockchain because mm. every everyone in the space knows how terrifying it can be when you hold your private keys. And that's it. If you lose them or if anything happens to you or the, pri or the place where you store your private keys or the places if more than one, then you're kind yeah. of screwed. Like, that's, and, you know? That's true but uh, yeah that's true I, I think like it comes from the from 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 the point that uh, people what they don't realize they want like both of the best of yeah. the both worlds right they want the total control over their money they want to be their own bank but also they don't want to have the responsibilities exactly. of a bank right at the same time because yeah. they want someone else to blame so um so i totally get that yeah. um you can't you can't have both and definitely there are decentralization maxis who are against any kind of intermediaries yeah for sure and i get that um i think who the intermediaries are is important as well um, when you're deciding whether you're for or against. Because, like, you know, me personally, you know, if 
what I'm seeing in this space and I don't like in that uh, um, in that um, perspective is that you know we we kind of did this 360 degree turn right like you know we we kind of closed the cycle and the circle because um in the very beginning we came to the space in most cases because we wanted to get rid of the intermediaries and we had all that same narrative with different flavors yeah. during the ico time it was getting you know democratizing the investments and kind of you know being able to to raise funds uh, but also kind of you know to invest without intermediaries um that kind of didn't work really well. Um, then we had the DeFi part we, where we were kind of, you know, against the banks and all these other institutions. Yeah. And we were doing peer to peer to get rid of those intermediaries. And then during the NFT time, you know, the whole narrative for the artists specifically was that we're getting rid of the gatekeepers uh, of the agents, the galleries, the people who decide whether you're good enough or not. So you directly sell to to your um, potentially, yeah. you know, people fans of your art. Essentially, what you ended up with was um, specifically in the NFT, you know, example. For example, you. Yeah, you got rid of the galleries and the agents, but you ended up with OpenSea. And what people didn't realize is just because that institution or, you know, that that marketplace or any other centralized marketplace, just because it's operating in this space, it doesn't make it a better intermediary. It's a centralized entity. It's a company. Yeah. It, it's a business. Eventually, it will screw you over if it doesn't really align yeah. with their <clears throat> business interests, which which is what OpenCD did, right? Yeah. So, so to me, it's it just doesn't really make sense if if, if we're you know gonna have intermediaries and equally bad as in Web two, then why even bother tell these nice stories which actually don't work, right? Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> and I or think, you know. Uh, Sorry. Yeah, Sorry, or even the banks, um, or even the banks, like we talk about centralized exchanges, and they're probably even worse than the banks, because they are less regulated and more risky. Uh, but it, they operate exactly like banks, simply, you know, instead of um, fiat, you're just holding crypto assets there. So what's yeah. the difference? You know, it's it's even worse than it was, right? Um, so so I don't know, like, uh, we have actually um, a question. And I, I know that we're going to wrap it up really soon. But we have a question from LinkedIn. Um, what do you wash think about the NFTs. wash trading of NFTs? And I think, you know, I know that it's a really big issue, for sure, obviously, less in less volumes now than it, it has been during the hype cycle for sure uh but still i i think it's still happening and uh, and yeah what are your viewpoints and and maybe like my follow-up question is that um is there a like from the regulatory perspective is there a way to actually punish that activity uh, well, what do I think about the activity itself? Yeah, it's, it's a problem and I highly discourage it. Uh, in terms of uh, whether you can address it from a legal and regulatory perspective, in the UK, we have the Money Laundering Regulation 2017, which I mentioned before. So if you are uh, issuing or facilitating the exchange of um, crypto for crypto or crypto for fiat, and it includes NFTs, so far, you know, we have no guidance to the contrary of that, then yeah. you should implement, first of all, you should be a register with the FCA and second, you should implement KYC checks. So that should help preventing that. Of course, when you're trying, when you're saying NFTs and KYC in the same sentence, people want to burn you alive because again, people, especially in the NFT space, you know, yeah. there is a high resistance for that. So that you address it through KYC, even there, I don't know, I've read a paper once about the fact that KYC is not as effective as we like to think, and it's actually very ineffective. Um, and I, I don't remember exactly, it was about crypto, but I don't remember exactly in which context. <laughs> Apologies. Bless you. <laughs> Apologies. I don't remember exactly in which context, but it was like less effective than 1%. It was like not point, not something percent. The KYC, so, man. The like KYC. Yeah, at that, at that time, in that context, I don't remember exactly, but what I remember is that it was surprising for me to understand how ineffective it was in that particular instance that related to crypto. But so, 
Yeah, I mean, I have a funny story about KYC, basically, you know, as I said, like I was part of an ICO team back in 2017. Mm -hmm. And we had, um, you know, we had pre registrations open, I think we had about I don't remember, like 40,000 people pre registered to the thing or well, I don't remember the exact amount, but it was like tens of thousands of people pre-registered um, and and we were doing KYC um, with the whole team day and night, yeah. you know, getting it up and, and looking at the whole thing. And I, I remember like it was so funny. Um, I don't know what it was about, like crypto bros or ICO bros or Lambo guys or whatever we can call them. But there was a high percentage of guys which were topless, shirtless, you know, <laughs> having their selfie done. So, um, so that was kind of, you know, something we didn't really expect, but we saw so many of those, like during so those- crypto, you know, crypto is good for health. It's good for muscles, yeah. no, I'm <laughs> uh, Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, you wouldn't really say all of them were kind of with muscles, but, but still that, so, that there was something about it and it was really kind of, you know, our also, internal joke <laughs> topic. Also, another thing I would say is that you have on-chain solutions that allow you to you know run a risk assessment on uh, wallets so at least oh, you can yeah. see if the wallet is associated or is known to have been associated with a scam that was reported in the space so that might help if you're a service provider i mean it will it is something expected uh, of you if you run a a project um that you implement these type of measure to prevent uh, you know bad actors from accessing or leveraging your services but then you have you know tumblers and mixers that can come in the way it's it's not easy and i remember you know when I, when i was in gibraltar i used to run this podcast called um, blockchain rock and i interviewed joe matonis who was one of the original uh, cypherpunk and um, he was talking at the time about this race where and uh, this uh, race between regulators and uh, you know sort of the kyc measures and not necessarily bad actors, but people that wanted to prioritize privacy, decentralization. So the solutions that you have to sort of track who's using what and who's using what are always going to be sort of in, in a race with better tools to mix and tumble sort of fun. Yeah. So it's it's a continuous effort, you know, not just um, not just in crypto, but I would say everywhere. So yeah, and I think just one note on centralization because you said a few things that are really interesting before. I think that. Part of it is centralization of organizations and sort of, uh, you know, uh, firms and because of regulation. But we are also, as human beings, wired in a way, I believe, to seek an element of centralization around influence. So you mentioned about, for example, NFTs. You know, patronage is a thing and there are big uh, players within the, uh, relatively speaking, within the NFT space you know, the Cosmo and the Medici or like 65, Punk 6529. Uh, and I'm not saying that they're bad. I think they're great for the space. Necessarily, because of the level of influence that they've managed to achieve, people are going mm -hmm. to follow and are going to, you know, uh, behave in accordance to what they do. And I'm not trying to suggest they should be regulated and I'm not trying to suggest they're bad actors at all. What I'm trying to say is that even within a decentralized space, there is an element yeah. of, this, of centralization, which I think is often expresses influence over a community. Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's as you mentioned, it's there is a human um, nature factor to it, and and people kind of you know always, it's always easier, right? Like to pick up someone, track their wallet, see what yeah. they are buying, not think too much and analyze and do your own research yeah. and just mimic and just mimic that right it's 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 people are also lazy by nature as well mm. so it's it's kind of you know they're looking for shortcuts that uh, they want to get rich quicker with less effort uh, sometimes it's also trust you know sometimes it's also just trust because you trust someone that you yeah you, in which you believe you, you know like it's you you pick someone whose choices you trust and yeah. you mimic the choices that that's what i meant basically that you know obviously you know you trust that what they are doing is actually going to be successful which is why you you decide to copy yeah. them specifically uh i mean i i don't trust most of the people's judgments about who to trust in these days in this space um to be fair uh but that's that's a completely different topic <laughs> for conversation um anyway yeah i think we we covered quite a lot uh 
um, obviously, as you said, like, you know, I, I, you know, I knew we couldn't really make this conversation very practical because, as you said, different legislation, like, you know, global audiences, different use cases, very specific things depending that vary from project to project. So obviously we couldn't really cover that. I think like the, the, the main takeaway is that, you know, things are becoming more regulated. It's always nicer to, to address those from the very beginning before it's too late and too complicated to fix afterwards. And, um, and that, uh, yeah, I mean, it it may uh, sort of, you know, impact the, the future developments of the space in terms of innovation, in terms of mass adoption, in terms of uh, hopefully less bad actors or bad actors knowing that there will be consequences of their actions eventually and it's not going to be so easy to escape. Um, but, but we'll see, I guess the future will, will show like the last sort of, you know, any... Uh, I don't know, forecasts or like, you know, how do you imagine this space? I know it's kind of, you know, very hard to do that yeah. in this space because mm. it's so unpredictable. But any anything that you're hoping to see um, in the near future? Uh, so I hope uh, that's a very, it's a very good question. And <laughs> it's not something I ever really think about. So I hope that you know, I'm, I've I've spent quite a lot of time during the bull market, spending time in real life with with the re, you know with the community in London and also abroad, I've been to events, and I love that feeling. So I definitely hope that that comes back and that there is more of an interest around you know that a, a healthy. I mean, I don't want to say healthier, like just the, the type of interest around NFTs particularly is not limited to financial gains and. <clears throat> that's the quickest interest that you can capture and the quickest one that you can lose when the economics don't work anymore. But I really hope to see more artists returning to the space and to these meetups to, you know, be able to discuss, um, you know, how the technology can be used for very interesting use cases that are not necessarily, you know, financial in nature. And I think that something that is not purely financially in nature does not necessarily mean that it's not something that you can later on monetize as a business. Because bear in mind, when you're looking to, at entertainment, the entertainment industry, you're normally creating content that is either entertaining or educational, and then you find a way to monetize that. So yeah. I really hope that there is a bit more of a focus on uh, how can this technology be leveraged to enhance someone's expression, artistic expression or, or otherwise, and how can I embed this in my business uh, offering current, which is, might, might not have to be Web3, and make it interesting. How can I how can I play around with this to make things that are interesting and move a little bit away from, oh, if you get this, you get X amount of tokens, yeah. you're going to get an airdrop. Because frankly, okay, everyone likes money. Everyone likes free money, uh, myself included. But it gets a bit boring, and it also kills the sort of underlying it's... message of, of a particular field, be it animation, be it... Uh, art or yeah. you, you know it, it all becomes a community I, of traders yeah i think it gets boring because it's all copy paste like you know yeah. something works everyone copies what works yeah. until it stops working and then someone else comes up with something and then that works and then everyone else copies so you know i i feel like you know instead of copying I would like to see more people coming up with new ways that work, yeah. but but not just one after the other, but parallel yeah. to each other. So we don't have to wait for that one thing to finish, to dry up yeah. until coming up with something else instead. Because we had 10K 0 0.08 collections for how long? over and over and over again. Yeah. Right? And then we had the niche sort of variations of that, that plus women avatars that plus <laughs> i don't yeah. know animal avatars that yeah. plus what I, like okay but you know after a while people start yawning because like uh, yeah you know if, if i can add one thing another thing that i really hope to see is more projects especially existing one within the nft space extending their offering to building infrastructure to allow the holders to leverage the ap that they gave them because mm -hmm. we've had this boom in, you know, project that gave commercial rights to the holders of their NFTs. But realistically speaking, how many holders know how to, you know, yeah, secure a production true. and distribution channel for, I don't know, action figures, you know, or based on the underlying character that they hold. So 
I really hope the project take an educational sort of uh, aspect to them and start to teach people how what is IP, how can you leverage it, uh, also commercially, you know, but put the, put the holders in a position to fulfill that dream that was this, you know, sort of community building, um, you know, IP community building, like sort of doing it uh, not just as one project, but each person potentially building their own independent offering, incorporating that piece of IP. I think that's very interesting to me, and I hope to see more of that. Yeah, that is going to be more interesting and fun. So we'll see how things develop. I mean, I will, yeah, I really want, like, back in the days, like a few years ago, I interviewed um, Zima Buterin, the father of Vitalik. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, and he mentioned something that Vitalik had kind of, you know, written in one of their Ethereum yearly reports. Uh, and it was about projects that have a soul. Uh, and how important that is. Um, so I, I would like to see more projects with soul rather yeah. than just, you know, dollar signs in it. Um, because uh, I feel like, yeah, when, when there is a soul there, as you said, like, you know, when there it's something about more than the money and it's good, I think the money, money will come as well. As it's a result, result normally, yeah. yeah. It's a result of good decisions at the beginning, yeah. But... Thank, yeah. Annie, I, I, well, I just want to thank yeah. you again for having me. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. Me too. And um, and yeah, uh, everyone, thank you for watching. Thanks for your comments. And we'll meet you next week with a new episode. Take care. Bye. Thanks a lot, everyone.